I like how you put um, where you're concerned with the moral arguments of education. And I think this really aligns too with some, a lot of your recent work about um, how you describe civic education as a process of learning how to live together. Um, how does this differ from traditional approaches? And then could you also expand on what education as learning to live together means? Yes, thank you for that. So this is something I've been thinking about for, uh, for a long time is civic and moral education. And one thing that has been enorm enormously helpful for my understanding of civic and moral education is to work and live in different countries. So in the United States, there's not really a focus on moral education. It's known as a, like a controversial issue because it's related to religious education, the separation of church and state. Um, moral issues are seen as quite controversial compared to discussing politics per se. When I got to Hong Kong, it was actually the flip of that. And what is non-controversial is discussing morality and being a good person in society. Uh, whereas discussing civics and politics is becoming increasingly taboo in this context. Um, something else I was thinking about a lot as I was conceptualizing education for learning to live together is I think that a lot about what we learn about learning to live together in schools is under the surface and something that we might call a hidden curriculum. It's something, um, so if I ask you, what did you learn about being a good person and living with other people in society in schools? or what did you learn in civic education? You might say, I didn't learn anything, uh, but what I like to do is look beneath the surface. Okay, we do have certain understandings which we hold about how to treat other people in the world, how to treat our neighbors, how to treat our family and friends, how to treat uh, people in our society, people who are similar to us, people who seem to be different from us, and how to treat people all around the world. So all of us do have an attitude about that. And we've learned that attitude from a variety of sources. One of those sources is schools. Schools is charged with um, something which we describe across countries as civic education, citizenship education, something like this. Um, but I want to argue that a lot of that content is not just in one subject, because most societies don't actually have a subject of civic education per se, um, but people learn about it through a variety of experiences in education. So they learn about it from history education. Uh, they learn about it from geography. Maybe when you're learning a second language, you learn some messages about how to treat diversity in your country or internationally, and just the attitudes of people around you. Um, and media is a big part of that too now. Uh, so for me, learning to live together, it, uh, focusing on that makes me discover a lot more than I would discover about this process if I was only focusing on the traditional curriculum. Uh, so most people who might study civic education across cultures might look at, okay, what is the subject in England? What is the subject in Hong Kong. So in England, it's, it's X and in Hong Kong, it's Y. Uh, but then you're actually gonna have a hard time comparing the two. In fact, in all societies, we do learn how to connect with people around the world, but we do that across curriculum. Uh, so I tried to really sort of flip the script. So in order to then start thinking about it systematically, um, because this is just so broad, I'm I, I wanna touch on everything here, um, but it is too broad and nobody knows about everything happening in the world. So in order to try, try to make it systematic, I created my own framework, which is learning to live together in concentric circles of uh, human connection. So starting with family and locale. So in kindergarten, everyone learns about their neighborhood, explain about your family, explain about your school community. Then you learn, eventually you learn about your nation state, your country. You might learn also about your local region or sort of the larger region. So in Hong Kong, of course, you're gonna learn about Hong Kong. You might also learn about Western civilization, Asian civilization, being an African, something like that, being part of the European Union. And then you have the global community. So with that framework in mind, I think, how are people learning about these different 
levels of relation and how to connect with people across those levels of relation through education. And then that enables me to say, look, this is happening everywhere. Uh, because a lot of people will say, oh, we, we're lacking a moral education curriculum in the United States, or we're lacking a civic education curriculum in Hong Kong. But from this perspective, we can then dig down beneath the surface and see how there is education about living together and uh, connecting with people, but that um, education is just not a subject like learning to live in the nation state. That, that, that subject doesn't exist, but there are many lessons you can draw if you look at diverse sources um, in the school experience. So, so kind of linking the, the, the first question and the second question together, um, this question of moral education and um, moral argumentation in your work um, is an interesting one. And I, I wonder how you handle, uh, first of all, perhaps how you define morality and how that definition then, um, how, how it informs your philosophical argumentation. I guess I, could, I, guess I can hear some, some uh, questions or objections or something like this, that morality tends to be thought of as kind of a prescriptive set of judgments. So how do you handle questions of, of value and judgment in your work in relation to moral argumentation and the gap between what schools do and what they sh what they should do as as you were saying and perhaps maybe you could then link that back up to these different scales that you're talking about um, yeah yeah so this is one of the most difficult questions um, and i find myself constantly interested in these moral questions i actually used to be mostly interested in political questions. Maybe it's the influence of living in Hong Kong that's made me more interested in them as moral connections and seeing the relationship between what is moral and what is political. Um, because I think for me, so, so on the one hand, you have these political topics and people have different views about them. Um, and I'm starting to think about it more in education uh, as an individual experience. And then I think a moral argument becomes important because that's more about how an individual should treat and regard the world. Uh, but this is pretty difficult territory for sure. And I think this is something where people could say there's some limitation or question my approach. Um, I, I, I do think it's possible that living in Hong Kong has really influenced me here because I'm feeling more and more a departure from a lot of my American colleagues who are puzzled, why am I interested in these things as moral things? And I guess one of the challenges is that uh, when people think about morality, they think about uh, individual uh, person's experience and the fact that everyone has a different experience um, and we don't all sort of have the same uh, so there's a diversity of experiences, but we also don't have all the same sort of equalities and capacities and privileges and advantages in society. So here I'm thinking about, um, I'm often confronted with and, and having a dialogue with Martha Nussbaum's work, and I am attracted to, to liberal theory. I keep coming back to uh, Immanuel Kant for whatever reason, and there's a lot of people um, that's a lot of thinkers I'm inspired by, but I often think about his uh, his exploration of freedom and autonomy. And there, I mean, he was really focused on some basic moral principles. So, so I keep coming back to these myself, and I think they're shared across a lot of philosophies, although they're not always articulated in the strong way that some liberals will art articulate them. Um, basically treating everyone with respect, how to create a situation where everyone can be a person and develop in their own rights with their own actualization and realization. Uh, so, th so those for me are just critical, uh, really important things to think about, um, but they do take me back to a liberal tradition. And so the problem with the liberal tradition and the reason why I'm confronted with the work of some liberals today, like John Rawls or Martha Nussbaum, is they have this, you get a sense when they start making a detailed argument that they're talking about a very specific circumstance, which is their own circumstance. So, um, and Martha Nussbaum struggled with this in discussing cosmopolitanism. So this connects, I think, to some critiques I've received of my book, uh, Questioning Allegiance, which is 
that cosmopolitanism really assumes a certain um, framework where everyone's an individual and the whole world can come to a sort of universal perspective and come together and be on the same page. And I guess questions there are, is it possible for everyone to be on the same page and come to an agreement about the issues that really matter? Uh, is that the right approach to take when there's really sort of deep conflicts across groups? Uh, and I think, uh, so, so for, for Nussbaum, she actually went away and departed from a cosmopolitan view, um, saying at heart she's a liberal and she's more concerned with uh, sort of what is important for liberal societies in terms of treating an individual. Uh, so, so in Asian societies, the individual is not always treated as uh, such a significant player. Um, and what was the second part of, I don't know if, I don't think I answered everything you asked. I think I got confused by myself. <laughs> well, no, that's, 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 that's great. So you, you draw inspiration from uh, Kant and from the liberal tradition in thinking about how you negotiate questions of value and judgment and moral ar argumentation. I mean, the second question was, how do you um, negotiate a, these things across scales? But you're also talking about the individual, um, you know, the particular and the universal, the individual and the collective, and, and you're, you're already sort of, um, you're already sort of grappling that a little bit with your answer. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you'd like to say anything more about that, but that, that, that's, that's sort of where we were. Yeah, I mean, this is something, and this is something I keep coming back to, uh, the individual versus the collective. Uh, and I think, on the other hand, when we see what's happened in the last year in the United Kingdom and the United States, I think this is um, a critical point to think through. Is there too much, individual, um, too much individualism uh, in those countries? And is there not enough sense of the collective? So I'm increasingly interested in this, this relationship and how there's never really an absolute individual freedom, um, but that people always are sort of part of a collectivity. Um, and people have this sense that Confucianism and other Asian traditions there's no, no sense of self in those traditions, and that, that might be true for some senses of Buddhism, but um, actually there's some interesting uh, connections uh, between Confucianism and liberalism. I mean, both of them support the sense that there's universal principles for treating each other, uh, but then the, the place of relationships becomes more important in those contexts. Uh, so one thing I struggled with and one thing I hoped to articulate in questioning allegiance is that we learn to live together in these different, uh, what I would call spheres in every society, but that looks different in every society and there's different tensions in each of those societies. Uh, so I wound up at the end thinking, actually even the sense of self and being a good person is taught about slightly different in, in different contexts. And that's what uh, actually drove me then to uh, do the research and write the book on Beyond Virtue is thinking through, actually so many of these things are deeply felt at the individual level. Um, and it's not just about how an individual treats people out there, but it's really about how each individual feels about the world around them. Uh, so this is, this is probably gonna be my main project for some time to come. And, and in part, it's probably just my own grappling with living in uh, Hong Kong. And before I lived in Hong Kong, I lived in South Africa and Abu Dhabi, which are also very um, more communal societies, more communitarian societies, and just grappling with, okay, what are the deeply felt views about the world, um, which are moral views? Uh, so, uh, so one thing, going back to moral philosophy, I think we all have these moral philosophies, but trying to actually put them out there and say, okay, what is the moral philosophy that we have? And let's really grapple with that because that's gonna be in tension with some other things in this contemporary world. Um, and I guess that's why I'm driven to moral philosophy, although it's maybe seen as um, conservative in some contexts. My goal isn't to say we should do what Kant says or what Confucius says or follow a strict moral code. It's more about, we have these assumptions which are about personal morality and if we can work these out and elaborate them 
and bring them to light, uh, maybe we can, uh, we can help young people to really think about these things. Um, I think probably in the US there's a tendency to crystallize all these conversations as if they're about politics and identity. Um, and that's one way to do it, but that's not, not the way I'm thinking about it from Hong Kong today.